So I would like, without any further ado, to introduce today's presenter, uh, Professor Gary Boma. He has extensive experience on today's topic. He's the UNESCO Chair in Intercultural and Interreligious Relations Asia Pacific. He's Emeritus Professor of, Professor of Sociology at Monash University, Australian Node of the Religion and Diversity Project, University of Ottawa, Acting Director of the Global Terrorism Research Centre and Associate Priest in the Anglican Parish of St John's East Malvern. He is President of the Australian Association for the Study of Religions. Um, and he's asked me to keep his introduction short, so I'll just skip a little bit of this. He, he was born in Michigan in the United States and moved to Australia in 1979 to take up the position at Monash University. He, is also, he also serves as an Anglican priest and is a religious professional in more than eight denominations, an active promoter of healthy interreligious relations, seeking to increase the appreciation of rich contribution of religious diversity to our social and cultural life. Please welcome Emeritus Professor Gary Bomer. Thank you for that, Amanda. Uh, and thank you for coming out for this, uh, well, discussion of things. There we go. Can, uh, can we have a full screen, please? Uh, I'll be reporting on research, uh, which is a result of an ARC uh, discovery project that we were awarded in, in uh, 2016 for, to study the world views of Australian teenagers as with Rasmussen and Bauma, who were then at Monash, and Halifoff and Singleton at Deakin. Uh, I give, give credit to that team. It's been a great team, a great working team, and a lot of fun. Uh, there's also a publication. Now, Australia's religious diversity is changing every time we get a census. I mean, I've been here 40 years. It's been eight sensi, and it's been wonderful fun, calling it like a horse race and seeing what goes on. And every time something new comes jumping out and f forces a rethink. And that's part of what we're doing this morning, uh, afternoon. Uh, and so how things are changing. But how Generation Z is very much leading the way. And we'll get to that after a few bits of looking back. Then we'll look forward. The context is this recent change in profile. We've moved from British Protestants being dominant to Catholics being dominant from 1986 to nuns, which are the dominant group now. If you don't know what a nun is, it's somebody who declares no religion in the census. And things have gone also from a battle between the religious and the secular to a diversity of diversities which begins to dazzle the imagination when you get out there. There are no polarities, and pol polar thinking just doesn't suit the age at all. And I'm going to present the latest data on the teens. By the way, you got a question, put your hand up. Asking questions at the end, we've all forgot what it was about. I, too, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, particularly for the way in which, for 50,000 plus years, they have maintained a rich diversity of religions, cultures, languages in this land we now call Australia. Many societies, many nations, but diversity is what's normal for this land called Australia. Yeah, 2% identify as, re as indigenous, but it's, this is just simply part of it. And taking that on is one of the jobs that we're doing more and more each day. OK, a little bit of retrospection. Each one of these columns represents a generation. I'm not really in it. I was born before 1947, but things looked like that then. So if you were born here or here before the end of 1960s, Anglicans were the big players. Catholics were, meh, all right, because if you added the Anglicans and MCPRU, Methodist Congregational Presbyterian Reformed and Uniting, you got a big fat majority of the population and you could leave the Catholics alone until 1986. Uh, and the percentage Christian wobbles along and comes down. But in 66 is the end of that, but lots of people were born before that. Some of them try to run the country and some of them used to run the country and did it as though they could go back there, thinking of Johnny Howard. By 1991, things have changed. Anglicans down to just over 20%. Catholics, very strong, institutionally secure, very powerful, definitely the leading organization in the place. MCPRU dribbling. And in 2006, 
Pentecostals at 2.7 and up to 3.7 in 216. They are 2,000 more numerous than uniting. Look at the way the census presents this stuff. There are Pentecostals, always 1.1%. I get suspicious when it's always anything. But then there's another thing called Christian Not Further Defined that includes Hillsong, Australian Christian churches, and a whole bunch of other sounds like Pentecostals to me. So add them up together, that's what you get. Christians down to 52%, but those who say we are a Christian country go bang up against it because only in New South Wales and Queensland is there a majority Christian. Aside from those two states, we use all minority groups. Now, a lot of people don't like that, but that's where it is. So these generations each tell a story because if people are born in it, that still is what normal in their minds. But this is where the kids, kids I'm going to be looking at have been born basically in here, roughly. Yes, you may. You've uh, used the word Gen Z for these guys. Yep. Big deal. There's a whole bunch of words. We use Gen Z, but we'll get, the, we'll get there in a minute. Thanks. Good question. Good question. It's a, it's a, 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 you know, nobody's agreed on that. It's just that, uh, here we are. Okay. The next tier of religious groups, just to remind ourselves, there are more Muslims uh, than Presbyterians, more Buddhists than the Orthodox, more Hindus than Baptists, and for the first time, more Sikhs than Jews. So Jews fell a notch in the pecking order of major religious groups. Three times as witches as Quakers, <laughs> pagans, Baha'i. But here's a really fun one. There were the same number of atheists declared in 2006 as did so again in 2016. They are not a growing demographic group. And those who think nuns are atheists got to face up with that data, and they're simply wrong. That's the distribution. What does it say? Well, what drives it? Migration, of course, as ever since uh, European settlement, particularly bringing more Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, keeping Catholics afloat for a while. Uh, nuns are, hey, we, we were looking at a very large number of nuns and began to look around, and a lot of the nuns are Chinese, some European. So our migration is also bringing nuns. Conversion to Pentecostals from other Christian groups, not really from none, and conversion to none. But that's too strong because most of the nuns never were anything. It's not like they lost their religion. They didn't have one to lose. They wouldn't know what it was in a fit. We'll get there. The future of boomers and Gen X, to pa the failure, rather, of these generations to pass religion on. The failure of my parents no, not really. They tried and they won. I'm religious. My sister and brother are not. That's about the ratio. You've got two religious parents. You might get one religious kid out of three. Run that down a couple of generations, and that's how you get the data we have. The failure to take seriously what it means to grow a Christian. So what does it look like? Nuns are the most dominant group. You know, nuns are the most numerous in each age group until 65 plus. That's how dominant nuns are at this time. None is the new normal. According to the AGZ, Australian Gen Z data, 52% of those 13 to 18, that's who we're studying, identify as having no religion. 52%. It looks higher in the census, but that's because their mother's filling it out. 58% of teens never attend any form of religious service. But here you go. Importance of religious faith. Yeah, 36 say no, but some for 42%. Oh, suddenly things look a little bit more interesting. These nuns aren't irreligious, anti-religious, and very 22%. So we got diversity out there amongst these teens. Not religious, but not anti-religious. And in this context of nuns being normal and no group being a real majority, those who have a religion 
have to explain themselves. Ah, well, that's not normal to a lot of people who were born back then. Having to explain yourself for having a religion, get over it. That's normal. No, it's not. And they don't like being in a minority. And they get cranky about it. And we hear them in the papers screaming for religious freedom and this, that, and 10 other things as they can feel their fingernails scraping on the blackboard going down. Not comfortable being in a minority. Not learning how to be one group among others. Okay. We've been talking about these groups as though they're kind of blotches of one color, but hey, hey, there are 1.6 billion ways to be a Muslim, I'm told. Anglican diversity is legendary and wide. Religion and spirituality are out of control of both the church or religious organizations and the state. I've been saying that for several decades. It is now so obvious it's not funny. Religion and spirituality are totally out of control of religious organizations and the state. We can all who know our history go back in time to when the state tried to control these things. <laughs> We Anglicans have a lovely history of burning people, this and that persuasion in the past, and not letting them in here or there. Gone. Any notion that somehow the state can control religion and spirituality would be met with absolute raging laughter. Yes. Yeah, that's right. They still has organizational control, uh, but they might find their way around it. I understand the state, but when you're saying out of control of the church, I don't understand how they are losing that. It seems like there's a lot of religious privilege and overreach. Okay, I, I agree with you with that. Uh, it's it, The problem is it doesn't work. Were you going to respond to this? And both those statements are, are very much true. The, what this is reflecting is that from 1960 on, people have had agency and choice about what they believe, what they do, and how they go about it. And for the church to tell them they can't, they're now just right up against uh, a serious difficulty. You're talking about a bureaucratic problem where a really, I mean, I've got this problem with, uh, with armed forces chaplains who decided that they cannot call a secular caregiver's spirituality person within their forces a chaplain because the church owns that. And I'm taking that one apart. Uh, the church doesn't own that one, but that's, that's the kind of ownership you're talking to. We aren't going to let that go. We, you can't come in here. You're not one of us and so on. Yes, there's some of that, but that's a very much a rear guard action in this context. They're freely, see, it's, you can get this stuff immediately off the web with a click, and they do. These kids are at that all the time, and they're very savvy about it. They aren't stupid, and they can smell thinking stuff a long way away. So now, a person's religious identity doesn't tell us very much. It just doesn't. And less now than ever before. This agency is so much, you might say you're an Anglican, but hey, after that you've got to know what kind, it could hurt. Uh, okay. Now, so the study that I'm reporting on, very, very high quality work. We, it's, it's involved three kinds of data collection. We conducted focus groups in high schools all over the country. Why? To hear what kids were saying about this area. And we started off with a kind of uh, religious literacy test with about 20 pictures of things, and uh, like the Pope and the Dalai Lama 
and this and that, a mosque here and a church here, and uh, could they identify it and did that get conversation going? Well, I hate to say it, but the religious literary stuff was uh, paper thin, uh, spread a bit. They knew about difference, some of them. Some knew more than others, and if they had had any training about religions in their, train, in their high schools, then they knew more. Take, being taught in your own faith, well, at least you knew one, but it didn't help that much. And of course, not having any training was the worst position of all. But anyway, so, what, so we could know what questions to ask. If we asked a bunch of questions of religious literacy taken out of the literature published 20 years ago, they would look at it and say, eh, can we end the conversation now? Anyway, so we did. And it was a lot of fun doing that. It was just, I mean, I couldn't figure out how I was going to get these 77-year-old ears near somebody who happens to be 17. But I had a younger person with me. And uh, they opened up, and we you know, had really good conversations. And, and in, we're enjoying, as you said, somebody said, that they're interested in this stuff, but they're going to choose their own way through it. So out of that, we then constructed the questions for a national representative, RDDDM, random, direct dial, mobile survey of teenagers, which was conducted in late 2017. It was, in fact, conducted right over the period of the postal vote on same-sex marriage, uh, just by accident. That's when we had to go. Uh, but so we have the highest quality of a random sample of, t of teenagers in 2017 that you could possibly get. Uh, and we're lucky because we have an earlier study called The Spirituality of Gen Y, which used the same technique on a variety of similar questions so that we can do some comparisons, you'll see. Followed up, we then took that data and crunched it with what's called a latent class analysis to find out what are the, what are the views that kind of line up and stack up together. And that threw up six or seven categories. And then we had a major Donnie Brook deciding what to call them, as you'll see in a minute. <laughs> but but it, this, this, again, is what's there, what they say, what kind of, how do they group out of that? And then after we, we had follow-up interviews to make sure that the people we put in those categories felt they fit there. And that was very informative and we didn't have to move anybody. They thought it was a really interesting thing. So that's the, that's the methodology which you may or may not be interested in. Hello. Sorry. There we go. Okay, I want your issue on, on generations. Here are the generations uh, pretty normally taken in Australia. Uh, the silent generation, yes, I'm part of that. Uh, boomers, uh, which have generally been the largest uh, generation for many years, have been, uh, uh, well, exceeded by, sorry, ex for years, have been exceeded by Generation Z. So you get Gen X following the boomers, the millennials, and then you get Generation Z. Uh, and th there's no settlement about what this generation is called. Uh, there's all kinds of names floating about, but we settled on Gen Z uh, as, as being as good as anything else. Uh, so uh, in 2016, they were uh, 0 to 19, and they were 24.7% of the population. OK, we can compare the millennials in 205 with the Gen Z in 217. So here we go. Religious identity, well, 23% Catholic there, down to 19% here. Other Christian, down to 20. World religions, up to seven, as you would expect with the increase in the, uh, in the census. Nuns, 52%. So that's what people said when asked what their religion was. Other comparison between millennials and Gen Z. 49 believe in God, 37 believe in God. 55% believe in life after death, 47. 40% believe in angels, 35. Weekly services, 12. So overall, fitting the trend expected we have declined. 
if this slide is actually well full of stuff in which there's very little change in some ways, there's one major bit of change. So 31% believe in reincarnation down to 29, 23 to 20 on believe in astrology. 24% uh, believe it's possible to contact the dead. Uh, and then for spiritual practices, have seriously got into tarot cards at 6%. They're hanging on there at 6%. Well-being practices. Look at this. From 4% and 7% in 205, 28 and 2%, and this is seriously, and it says seriously, outside of school. So this isn't a bunch of kids who've gone to a school that makes them meditate on, uh, on afternoons. This, this is a huge increase in practicing meditation, in mindfulness and all of that, which is fascinating uh, to, to find that, because everything else is kind of hanging in there slight to clients. Yes? That taught in school. Oh, yes. But they do this out of school. I mean, how, what kind of an impact of schooling would you want to have? <laughs> That's pretty important. There's your impact of schooling. I'd take great pride in that. Okay. More beliefs. No belief in God, higher being, or life force. 6% of Catholics don't believe in God. Hmm, oh well. World religions, 14% don't. Nuns, of course, 42. Belief in God, Catholics up there, other Christians way up there. World religions, it, you know, not surprising at one level. Higher being, life force, not God. Nuns, yeah, got some nuns in there. Don't know, nuns don't know. So again, it's it's not all none. It's 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 already diverse by religious identification. And then you do male, female, and there's uh, males are more likely to believe stuff than. Females uh, in every category. Uh, the beliefs themselves, uh, belief in astrology, 20%. Karma, 50%. They really re they're really into karma. Uh, reincarnation, 29%. Uh, and the possibility of community of the dead, 25 Ghosts, 31 UFOs, 21 I'm a religious and spiritual person, so trying to, you know, again, tease out what's going on here. What would they call themselves? Well, 20% of Catholics uh, say they're religious and spiritual. Other Christians, 41. World religions, 32. A total overall of 16, but it, it plays out differently when you put in type of religion in. So, uh, so it's very interesting. 0% of the nuns say that. I'm religious but not spiritual. 12% you know, overall, but very much in here spiritual but not religious. And that does come up to play in an interesting way in a few minutes. Uh, so your nuns here are saying I'm spiritual but not religious. Now that, that's, you know, that's quite interesting to me. Again, well, the whole business of what a nun is. I'm none of those things, well, all right. And I can't choose, okay. Uh, fascinating textures of stuff coming up. Uh, and then we get six types of Australian teen spirituality. We'll go through these types in detail in a minute. But we have six types. This is what came up in the latent class analysis. Okay, so you got the religiously committed. 17% of these eight, 13 to 18 year old kids were religiously committed. They went to the mosque, they pray regularly, they go to church, they identify as religious, they believe in God, all that kind of stuff. Then there's the nominally religious. They say, nah, I'm an Anglican, but do nothing about it. Could also say I'm a Muslim, do nothing about it. Uh, but it's sort of a cultural tag, and that's 20% of the population. Religious and spiritual. We'll identify these in more detail in a minute. Questioners, uh, these are people that are kind of wobbling back and forth, but uh, uh, we'll see. And then here and now, what you see is what you get. Science explains everything. There is no God. There's no religion. Uh, not anti this stuff. Just couldn't be bothered with that. That's 24% 20, uh, of the population. So there are the types. And as I said, we'll go through them in, in a minute in detail. Yes? Yes, I will. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I, these types, that's one way of looking at it quickly. And then uh, here we go. Uh, this worldly, uh, which is the here and now group in the other slide, 
23%, and there's no place in their worldview for religious, spiritual, or non-material possibilities. All the explanations are material. Indifferent or questioners, 15%. They're indifferent to religion, spirituality, and atheism, but it's just indifference. It's not active opposition. It's, it's not anti. It's just, eh, 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 no, not for me. Then the SBNR, spiritual but not religious. 18%. God, faith, religion are not important to them, but the door's kind of open. Yeah, spirituality, yeah, there's kind of, but they're passive about it, okay? So this lot, mob are passive, whereas the next mob, seekers, 8%, the religious but not spiritual, have a decidedly, or spiritual, I forget which way that's wrong, uh, have a decidedly eclectic worldview. They pick out this, and they'll go for that, and a bit of yoga, a bit of this, a bit of the other thing. They're active in the domain. It's a big difference between the SPNRs. These are active seekers, ha having fun, you know, just, oh, I'll have a bit of that, I'll do yoga on Tuesday, and oh, I don't know, go work somewhere else on Monday. Uh, and I like to go to lectures or something. And then, as I said, the nominally religious, 20%, culturally religious, many following their parents or guardians, community identity, but nothing really for them. And the religious they committed 17%. When they're Christian, they're mainly Pentecostal and evangelical. And then there's Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, or something else. Religion, faith, is a big part of their lives. And they say it is, and they, just, and they make that real in action, etc. So these are the six categories. The next step is to see whether these categories make any difference. So hang on, because it gets to be wobbly. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to look at. So the types are across the top, and the questions are here. So let us talk about support for same-sex relationships, that is, the question asked was, uh, do you support schools uh, per permitting the expression of same-sex uh, uh, sexual and gender diversity within schools? Uh, endorsers of that view, and there were about three questions on this. Endorsers of this view, well, overall it was 35%. Uh, open to this view, 52% overall, and resistors, 13 But you'll notice that the resistors pile up here uh, the endorsers pile up in here and here and here. Uh, and there's some interesting uh, nominal support and nominal, and this is about on the, on the money, uh, but your, your religiously committed are very much opposed to that. And that finding continues to come up time and time again. All religious groups in Australia should be free to practice their religion as they wish. That was the question. 89% say yes. So there isn't a heck of a lot of variance to play with here. Uh, <laughs> you got 89% saying yes. Uh, for someone to say no, well, they just strongly disagrees the top line. The religiously committed are the most likely to say no, but uh, they aren't so sure because they'd kind of like to be free to do their own thing too. So it's a question that you kind of fall one way or the other on. but. Uh, but that, to my mind, is the intriguing substantial file of, of, of finding of openness to religious diversity. Gary, yeah. You, uh, you say the religious you committed to the most support, but the same thing happens with this worldly one. So is it a question of people committed to a particular point of view? Which are you talking about? The oh, sorry, uh, so the this worldly column N. But uh, over there. With, re with respect down, to what? Down, down. Yeah. Yeah. That shows up from time to time. And, and what I'd love to be able to do is go back and ask, why, you know, what, what were you thinking when you said yes here? And what were you thinking when you said yes here? Here, they may want to be practicing their own. Here, they may be saying, yes, go ahead and do what you want. Very different kind of orientation. I, but we don't know, because we haven't had the chance to go back and unpack uh, what they were thinking when they did it. The highest is the seekers, not surprising, 
because they're busy going around trying everything anyway. But it, 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 I mean, reading through this stuff is, is difficult. Uh, local communities should be able to prevent the construction of mosques or temples in their area. Strongly disagree, 62% agree, 33. The most agreement is 40, well, sorry, 42 SBNRs, which is interesting in itself, 41 here, but that's over against 53% disagreeing. So again, the diversity of the views in this group is so large uh, as to make any kind of generalization impossible without knowing more about what's behind it. Uh, 62 to 33, yeah, that gives you the sense of overall uh, there's a, an openness to the construction of religious premises wherever. But when you start looking within, uh, there is uh, and the 41 and 42 are uh, outliers, the rest is just is under, uh, but it's hard to find anything that you put, uh, uh, put much weight on. Religion causes more problems in society than it solves. Again, how do you answer that one? Uh, strongly disagree? Well, religiously committed, strongly disagree. But 31% strongly agree. <laughs> so, so you've got two ways of looking at it, I would say. Uh, you're reli nominally religious or uh, disagreeing and agreeing. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, uh, the largest agreement is here, not surprisingly to me, in, the, in the, uh, uh, this worldly group. Uh, and the rest, 54% SBNRs. Uh, so again, it's the textures that are interesting and the inability to, to polarize this data or to, to say that there is a, a, a definite, simple view. This tells you there's a, tr a good tendency toward it, but not a, a, not a settled view in the group. And then that lack of settlement comes out very clearly in this. Religion should have no place in our parliament or official ceremonies. Look who says, they strongly disagree. Yes, of course, the uh, religiously committed want it in there, uh, but so do the seekers. They want, they, they want to find religion anywhere. Yeah, well, if you have something in there, that'll be fun. Maybe a cross, maybe a, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, but overall, there's strong agreement uh, and substantially disagreement. And, uh, strongly agree is down here uh, with the, again, the this worldly and the indifferent uh, being the most uh, to agree, but no symbols in parliament or official ceremonies. It will come to an end in a minute. Uh, Okay, having met people of many faiths makes Australia a better place to live. 93% say yes. Well, again, if you got a finding like that, your variance isn't, isn't going to be worth looking at. Uh, now, there's some this worldly who disagree, 8% of the religiously committed, but that's as high as you can go in a context where they've got 93% saying, yeah, it works, it's good, uh, and that's consistent with other uh, well, it's consistent with, but it's much higher than, say, the Scanlon findings, etc. Uh, the government should ban any religious clothing. Uh, strongly disagree, 72%. Agree, 24 So again, we've got diversity and disagreement. The strongest banners uh, are these nominally religious. And that comes out from time to time when you're looking at this kind of... Uh, social acceptance uh, issue, you'll find that the religiously nominal who haven't been exposed to the more gracious aspect of their religion are likely to be less gracious than those that have. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it used to be fascinating to look at that in terms of race relations in the states, etc. The nominals were more likely to be racist than were the religiously committed. Uh, so that religion does do something. Strongly disagree here. And do you support marriage equality? Well, 82% supported marriage equality. And as I said, this was done right during the, uh, the vote. Uh, and it was a hot issue and certainly on the table. But 82%. And again, not surprisingly, 54% uh, said no. 
among the religiously committed, but 40% said yes amongst the religiously committed. And here, contrary to what I just said, in this particular issue, for the religiously nominal, 77% were in favor, and the rest are from the 90s. So that you get a very strong weighting toward the acceptance of marriage equality. Is that the way you answer the question? Yes. Yeah. All, all of these were as close to the way we are. <laughs> yeah. Gary, um, it's interesting. I, if I've read the earlier question correctly, you have an 83 This is a very different question. This is a question about do you support a, uh, attitudes to sexual and gender diversity in school? That is, do you support, part of, one of the questions was do you support teaching sexuality ec education in your school that is friendly to LGBTIQ and gives information about LGBTIQ and those kinds of much more pointed questions about activity in the school. And so out of that, Yes, there is, there is a 35% uh, endorsers and opens. Uh, this means they're open to it, uh, but aren't as strong as this, and here's the resistance. So. I just think it's very interesting that you've got a 35% endorsers, but you've got an 83%. Yes, but that's a different question. That, well, that's saying question. Uh, out there they can marry, I don't care who, yeah. but in my school, can they take their partners to the, to the dance? Can they do this? Can they do that? Much more pointed question. And that's the point I'm making, I suppose. Yeah. Yep. Yes, yes, much, much, much closer to home and, uh, and issues that were probably very current in the school at that time being late in the year. Uh, okay, f finally, uh, attitudes to Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam. Negative, boing. Moderate to neutral, no difference. Positive, seekers, of course. They're going around looking all the time. <laughs> they want to have stuff out there to look at. These three were picked out and asked separately. It, it wasn't, I mean, the results have been combined, uh, but uh, were there, big differences there was a slightly greater tendency to be negative about Islam, but it wasn't huge. Uh, and the one of the qualifiers in here was, did you have any education about uh, religion in school? And if you had general religious education, then you were more likely to be positive than if you had SRI or, or nothing. Uh, and that made a bit of difference. Uh, otherwise, you, you couldn't pull out a difference for having gone to a religious school or uh, anything like that. But that's, uh, but yes, when, when you combine them and get, are you negative or positive? Uh, but we, there weren't, it wasn't like, uh, there, there wasn't a 10% difference between, uh, say, Buddhism and, and uh, Islam. It was just a slight drop, and that's reflected in, in this, uh, and probably in this, because they all are Buddhists. So I, I say that Australian Gen Z are awash, but they're not adrift in a sea of diversity. They know who they are. And that was very clear, because they work from a confident base about knowing who they are and what fits and what doesn't fit. They're very comfort comfortable with difference Religious difference, gender difference, sexuality difference. 14% claim themselves to be LGBTQI. 85% want schools to allow openness. Slightly different question. If curious, they'll engage. Oh, you're a, tell me about it, or whatever. And, but the whatever is, in a sense, dismissive, but it's just saying, ah, come on along. It's not an issue. It's not dismissive negatively. It's just, come on. And they believe that people can live ethically without religion, 83%. And uh, there we are. But I was um, really delighted with the confidence, the readiness to be d discerning, and uh, the overall openness to diversity. Uh, and of course, religious diversity, because they don't have religion, they haven't been introduced to religion. If you wanted to ask them of how to do interfaith relations, well, you'd have to do an awful lot of education. Uh, and why would you do it? Because Oh, oh, so they get along well. Sorry, they're getting along well. You want to introduce stuff that's going to make it hard? 
I'm just, just it, it, we're dealing with a new generation. It does, what we would have to do for us and for people just after us is one thing. What you do for this mob is an entirely different thing. So, I've already talked about that. Oh, I, nah, anyway. Yes, we have the passing of white Protestantism. Yes, yes, oh, sorry. Uh, no. Oh, all over. Oh, no, seriously. The, I mean, the, first of all, the focus groups were literally all over Australia. We had money to go fly around. We went floating around and did them. Yeah. And the, the, the respondents to the uh, questionnaire, uh, to the survey, again, were all over Australia. It was, it was really fun to be, we, we don't know who and wh what they are unless they told us. That's why we could have follow-up interviews. But uh, just in terms of where the survey company said, well, here's where the, here's where the respondents are. It, it blanketed Australia. What was the sample size, right? Uh, 1,200. 1,200. Yep. Yes. Did you have a extra overall? Is there a change in extra overall? We haven't done that. I think we can pull it out a bit, but we did do metro rurals in the schools that we conducted focus groups in and couldn't find the dimes or the difference. Uh, not that I dismiss that. Uh, it could still come up in other ways. Uh, and it's getting to be incredibly difficult to find a rural area that isn't diverse. And uh, I think that diversity is wonderful. Yeah. Well, if you're an Anglican chaplain and you were to go to the Caulfield campus of my national university, and I know who does, uh, you, you don't have any entry points. There's no chapel. There is a spirituality center, which is basically used by Muslims and Buddhists. Uh, the percentage that might say they were Christian on campus would have to be minuscule. Uh, the nuns would be way up there. Uh, and so I, I've puzzled with that question, but you know, personally and, and with the person who's chaplain, uh, what would you do, put up a sign saying Christians come here? You might do that. Uh, and you can advertise that you have a motion law to defend and support. Yeah, what we do at, at St. John's East Malvern is we have on Friday nights during term time uh, an event for students. And, they, and some of them come all the way across Dandenong Road, which is threat, threat <laughs> well, it's a threat to life and limb. Uh, but uh, again, they come, we got a movie, they get a dinner, uh, they, go, they go home. Now, is, is that chaplain say, well, yes, it's care being extended. Some kids, I mean, East Malvern's about the deadest place on earth once the sun goes down. Uh, so it's, it's being open. Uh, being alongside, it's just, and people say, what to do? I say, and the churches say, what to do? And I say, Get out, get with the people, stop pontificating. And I would say the same for chaplains. You've got to be alongside. Now, how do you get alongside students? It's damn difficult. But you I'm, I'm talking about the, the council for church. I'm aware of that. Like, does that make sense? Is this no, no, no. I mean, in the olden days, you used to be able to scare up maybe five Anglicans for a mass on Tuesdays, but that was the 1980s. Yes, Helen? I'm sorry, but I, I would take your question very seriously, but I think that is now a dinosaur. Yeah, Helen? talking about an interfaith chaplain doing a whole bunch of stuff like seekers like uh, and quite frankly you put a sign up saying meditation here chances are people will come you put a sign up saying uh, well there were, you could see what was going on 
uh, something that was spiritual, that was not labeled, that didn't have the institutional adumbration of saying it was this flavor or that flavor, uh, you might have the capacity to come alongside students and then having been there, should something arise, they might come to you, they might not, but that, I think that's a perfectly fine model. Uh, getting the, the kind of chaplaincy running organizations to say we're going to be doing generic well-being spirituality stuff uh, has been extremely difficult because they hang on to their uh, 39 articles. Yes? Ortho, yeah, do, do the downward slides apply across the board? They apply differently. Orthodox, for the first time in the last census, came down with fewer numbers. Uh, and that's an indication of moving into fourth generation, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's a very interesting case, but a particular kind of community that very much functions on uh, a liturgical heartbeat that's maybe five or six times a year at the most. Uh, and uh, that's, I, I'm not gonna say less demanding, because if you're gonna do those five or six, you're gonna be, you know, it's gonna take a lot of doing. Uh, for the British Protestants, yes, it is simply down. Uh, not to zero. It's never going to zero, but it's sure going down. And the job of leadership is to find out how to be strategic. For Islam, you need to look at Catholics. Catholics get a lot of migration, and that keeps the numbers up and keeps young people in the age structure, which is the same as the national. But without that influx of migrants, it would look very different. And how long migrant Catholics will stay Catholic is an interesting question. I don't think we have a completely help, uh, useful infer, uh, answer to it, but studies elsewhere on the fate of migrant religions is that first generations just basically settle, finally discover they ought to be something. That's what I discovered in mosques and Muslim settlement. Oh, we'll put up mosques. They do that. The energy of the committee is channeled. Uh, and so the next generation is very much involved. The generation of that is trained into that. Uh, and the generation following that is now beginning to be more questioning, less open to directive, uh, more likely to find their own way to be a Muslim, and uh, in, t in due course, there will be more cultural Muslims. Uh, there are already quite a number, uh, but more and more of that uh, as, uh, as participation and the, the investment in producing a Muslim in the society uh, begins to, to not take hold in the same way. Same thing is true for Buddhists, uh, who are very much now in a, in a fluorescent kind of stage, uh, very attractive, getting some new migrants. Uh, and there's a, 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 a beautiful maturity about it that's very appealing uh, to both Buddhists and non-Buddhists. So there's, there's some energy in that. Uh, and that certainly, along with Islam, will be one of the steady beating heartbeats of spirituality in Australia. Uh, now with Sikhs, yes, uh, again, another one that will grow to a certain size and then shrink down. Judaism is, is basically uh, looking like Anglicans, uh, which is not pretty in terms of the future. Uh, but that's, that's what I see in terms of the, of, of the whole trend. Uh, barring accident, but we do keep importing people. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm studying another paper, studying that, and oh, it's amazing what, what's going on in terms of, uh, you know, well, uh, Chinese into Baldwin and, and uh, Sikhs and Muslims into uh, uh, Wyndham. Uh, you know, some interesting stuff going on. Yes, oh, sorry.
No. Uh, no, they haven't been around long enough, I think, to, to really get into that kind of question. But we didn't ask it, so I don't know. Uh, the, it is fluid. Uh, they are choosing. They aren't set in any particular way. Uh, and if I were, you know, home missions for the Diocese of Melbourne, I'd say it is a field white to harvest because some of them are looking around. And some people might warm to some kinds of Anglicanism. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, but the notion of them coming back, no. Uh, some will pick it up. That is, some will stagger into a religion of some sort and say, ah, didn't know about that. Tell me more. And that's the openness that's in here. Uh, they really are curious. They really want to know. And they might do that on Tuesday, but God help you on Thursday. <laughs> yes. Oh, they definitely saw it as spiritual practice. Well-being, spirituality, yeah, that, that, that whole thing hangs together in what we call generic chaplaincy now, generic spirituality. In their minds, it's all of a piece. Uh, yeah. I'm just thinking of the people who take yoga. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, what? what yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah, and whether, whether everyone did or not, I don't know, but certainly when we did the focus groups, that would come up as something that, you know, okay, that's part of the well-being. Sorry, what, I've, got, I've got one before you. Yeah. Ian? in the world. <laughs> Ivory towers are not the answer, nor is systematic theology. Sorry, I love it. It's a great game, but it's not the answer. Peggy, after. Yeah, um, I'm troubled by the ease with which you use the word spirituality. I'm using it the way they use it. Yeah, well, what's it mean to them? Then? I told you, that yeah. sort of stuff is spirituality. Uh, I mean, I could define it, and they might not like it. I, that's what we did the focus groups for, to find out what spirituality meant to them. Well, the, if, you, if you just go to the, the research literature on it. Yeah, that's old stuff. Sorry, this is a new generation that that old I'm stuff doesn't fit to. The, the current psychological literature. Yeah, it's old stuff. Who's we? You and I. No. Here. No. I don't. Well, what do you mean by spiritual? What, what do you mean? What, what, this, what, what did they mean? What, tell us what they mean. They would talk about a fuzzy orientation, that there's something more than just them, that the explanation of the here and now isn't adequate. Uh, meaning and, and purpose? Meaning, purpose, uh, and then practices around that. And so that's what we listened for. That's what we got. And that's the bundle that they talk about. That, and that's why we had to invent new categories or discover new categories of that spirituality, uh, which fits these people. The ones that we had from before, and especially American ones, which are all churchianity, uh, didn't fit. Yeah, I'm sorry, Peggy. If I knew for sure, Peggy, I'd write it on the board with three <laughs> dot points, and we'd all go home arguing about it. Um, as I work for uh, Ram's British Conference. My condolences. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, on, just picking up on a few things you said, though, um, you know, that the ten, ten men are not, uh, not anti-traditional. No.
get out into the world, get with them. And if you're, if you're as old as you are, or I am, it's probably impossible. No, but if you're engaging, as, uh, as Helen said, in sort of a general spirituality something, and then somebody within that asks a question to which you might have an answer, then you might get there. But otherwise, none of the stuff we front with. I think I go to I love I go to I go to two churches and the music is absolutely divine. I love it, love it, love it. And if I compare that music to what goes into the eardrums of those I ride with on the tram, you don't get from one to the other. What goes on inside our shops is not marketable to somebody under sixty. So you gotta get out. Get with. We, I'm not saying we don't have a message, but it's, you got to be out there. Where was Jesus? <laughs> yeah, right. What did Jesus say? Get. But remember the, the questions you asked, like the Parliament question. Yep, and yep. The danger of religion. Yes. We're feeding into a secularity question. Yes. Where is secularism? Any ism is poisonous to these people. It's very interesting. They, they aren't buying any ism. Uh, and secularity sounds like an ism and uh, a sort of a position. And they're certainly not interested in that. Uh, the whole religious secular thing requires either you're religious and looking out at something secular or you're secular somehow and looking at religion. And that's a polarity and they weren't doing it. Uh, and so I couldn't really respond except to say it didn't, it didn't key in with where they were. I think I could, one more and then I... Do you have a word or a term that might describe that? Sort of non-binary way of there's certainly not an opposition. Holism. Holism. Simple, straightforward, good old roar. Holism. Amanda, we need you. Stop these people. They're run, draining me dry. <laughs> Gary, thank you so much. It was uh, extremely interesting to hear your views and especially to delve down into the research that, as I say, I've read about before, but it was really good to get some more detail here too. Um, could you please join me in thanking Gary? Thank you.